From a broke college dropout to a multimillionaire, today I'm going to share my full story with you in this video. And I'm going to go all the way back to some details throughout my childhood, all the way through my college years and uh, into the workforce, into starting my own businesses, into YouTube, into investing. I'm going to go through the whole story in this video here today and a couple reasons I felt like doing this. One is I haven't done a video like this in years. I mean, it's been a long time since I just talked to the camera about my life, you know, how I got here and these sorts of things. I can't even remember the last time I did a video like this because I get so caught up in the markets, stocks, that's what we're talking all the time, right? And the second reason I'm doing this video here today is I feel like I feel like a lot of people have been hit very heavily by inflation in the last three years. And I feel like there's not a lot of inspiration out there. And I always feel like there needs to be some level of inspiration out there in the world. And so I think very few people are probably going to watch this video here today. And so I hope the very few people that do get to watch this video and learn everything that I'm going to talk about in this video, I hope that you get some inspiration on this. And I hope this helps you in your life and in the future and kind of looking from my lens and my perspective um, as far as an outlook on life. And I hope this, you know, some positivity because I think in this world of social media, it's very easy to get caught up into what the drama is for the day, what happened between this country and that country, what happened between this celebrity and that celebrity and who did what and what happened and, and all these sorts of things that are, you know, I, I don't think necessarily beneficial uh, to us as, as humans overall, right? And um, so I hope you enjoyed today's video. All I ask is if you do really enjoy this video here today, if you get some inspiration out of it, leave me a comment down there in the comment section. That's all I ask. Leave me a comment. Let me know if you found a lot of value from my videos over the years. Let me know if you found, you know, enjoyment out of this video and some inspiration, those sorts of things. Just leave me a comment down there. I would really, really appreciate it. Okay. So where I want to start out this video here today is we're going to go all the way back to, to understand how I went from, you know, where I started at, you know, in the financial game of a broke college kid, right, to multimillionaire. Like, how did that even happen? Well, I think there's a lot that goes into it. If we go all the way back to my childhood. So my dad, he started a small pool cleaning business, essentially, when I was about, I would say, five or six years old. Now, I started working in that business when I was probably about, I would say, eight years old or so. And so when other kids would kind of, their college break would come, I would go work with my dad. Now, we worked in Phoenix, Arizona. And if you don't know, Phoenix, Arizona is one of the hottest places literally in the world you can live. So to clean pools in Phoenix, Arizona is a, is a very brutal, brutal task. And, I mean, you're, you're looking at, you know, if it's a nice day, 105 uh, but many times it's going to be 115, 120 degrees, somewhere around there in Phoenix, Arizona, out, out in the sun, right? And people think, oh, you clean pools, you get in the pool, right? No, you don't get in the pool. That would be awesome if you did. Uh, no, you, you clean from outside the pool when you clean a pool, okay? So a few things that really taught me uh, that, I, that have kind of carried me to this day. One is work ethic. I mean, you know, getting to be there with my dad, you know, in, in the summertime, right? And getting to experience that we'd wake up 4 a.m., 5 a.m., right? And why do we wake up so early? The reason being is the hottest part of the day usually if for summertime in Arizona is usually between about 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock. So you want to try to get all your work done as quick as possible. And so we wouldn't even take any breaks. Like we'd get in the truck after cleaning one pool or doing a service job, right to the next pool, boom, get right out, do the next one, right? Our break was like the drive time in between going from one house to another house, right? So, you know, you want to try to get it done as fast as possible. So it really taught me work ethic because, man, you do some, you do manual labor like that out in that sort of heat day in and day out, whew, you're, you're going to know what real hard work is. And um, I think that's something that's, you know, everything from there was, was, it's always easy to me. When you start out with something like that and, you know, you experience that, everything else becomes very easy, right? And I really learned hard work. I also learned that was not what I wanted to do. I, I started to view life as like, man, there's got to be something better out there than this. Because for me, out in that heat, day in and day out in that summertime, whew, no fun. No bueno. I, did, that was, I was like, there's got to be better ways than this, man. This is, this is rough, right? Which 
there, there's, there's other ways, right? There's other ways you can, you can kind of make it and make a living and, and do sorts of things, right? And so that also taught me that. Also, we worked mainly in retirement communities. Uh, pretty much everybody was 55 and up. And most of these folks, most of my dad's customers were retired, right? And so I also got to view life since I was a child and getting to see all these older folks as I got to view like life as, you know, this thing that, that happens, right? And you eventually die and you want to position your life as, as well as you can possibly position it throughout your life, right? And so that, that also kind of always stuck with me as like seeing all those older folks and, you know, some of our customers ended up passing away over time and, and those sorts of things, right? I mean, my dad's had some pool, uh, you know, homes that he's probably been cleaning the pool for two or three different people that have lived in that same exact house that passed away over time, right? So, you know, all those things I think helped me out immensely. And so whenever school would go to start again, there was like a vacation in me, just to be quite frank. I mean, you know, my hard work was when I would go to work with my dad. The only thing that was ever sad to me about uh, whenever you know, the summer would get over was, oh, I didn't get to, I don't get to spend time with my dad now. I got to go back to school. That was really the only thing sad about it. Most kids dread going back to school. The only thing I would ever was just sad about was just like, oh, I don't get to spend as much time with my dad. Other than that, there was nothing to be sad about in that situation. It was like, oh, sweet. Go back to school. It's air conditioned. This is, this is easy. I get to sleep in till like 630 every day. Oh my gosh, man. It's easy. All the other kids are like, oh, I hate school. I'm like, this is nice. Now, in regards to school, we're, you know, I was not the best student. That doesn't mean I was a bad student. I just, uh, you know, to be quite frank, I didn't, I, you know, I came up in the, the Arizona public school system. Not a very good, impressive thing, just to be quite honest with you guys, especially back in those days. And, you know, I, I, most of the time when teachers would talk, I'd just be daydreaming and stuff like that, not even really paying attention. So I was not the, the great student in high school, right? Which, you know, leads me to kind of football. I played tackle football for five years. And the reason I got into tackle football is I wanted to play in the NFL. And I had these dreams of being an NFL player someday. Like, oh, man, I'm going to, you know, I used to watch NFL Network all the time and play Madden and just, like, dream about being an NFL player and how awesome that would be. And I wasn't that damn good at football. <laughs> it, was, it was very depressing. And it was hard because I was the hardest worker on the team. You know, coaches always gave me mad respect for how hard I worked. Like, there's one thing throughout my life, you're never going to be able to outwork me. I'll always outwork everybody. But even with all that work, I still never was good. I played every position. I played quarterback. Um, I played strong safety. I played cornerback. I played running back. I played Z back. I played receiver. I was kick returner, punt returner. And I was never that good at anything. I could do everything, but I was never that good at anything, just to be honest. I was very subpar. And so it was devastating to me back then. I mean, it was absolutely devastating because I really had these dreams of being an NFL player and I just wasn't even remotely good enough. Like I wouldn't even be able to play college football, never mind go to the NFL. And so to me, that was just, it was a hard time in my life at a very volatile stage, right? Where it was like, dang, man, like this didn't work out. I remember one of the greatest days of my life was the day we lost uh, the playoff game my senior year. One of the greatest days of my life. Literally, you know, if you think about the greatest days of your life, it's usually because of something so joyous happened or you were able to finally end a situation that was just, you know, really, really bothering you and it was putting you in a bad place. And uh, yeah, that was that was certainly that situation. So then, uh, you know, it's, it's senior year of high school, right? Football season ends. I was able to get involved in track because I had my best friend. Uh, his name was Giorgio, great friend of mine, you know, back in those days. And he was spectacular, a uh, track athlete. He was a really good at football too. And he was a very close friend of mine. And so he got me into track. And who would you known like that ended up coming in clutch because I don't know where I was going with my life, just to be quite honest at that particular time. And the reason being is I wasn't good at school. My grades weren't good. I never really put an effort towards school. I had put in a crazy amount of effort to football. That didn't work out right? Five years kind of almost down the drain. And I was like, what am I going to do? So there we are, it was, you know, it's track season and I'm running and I do decent. Not that great. Got bad shin splints my first year. Holy smokes. Uh, also learned there's a different sort of speed between football speed and track speed. Also, man, you got a, there's a lot of work to be put in there. So, um, 
that, that happened, right? And then it's kind of toward the end of the year, kind of around state championship time, able to meet a coach, Coach Neighbors, a um, uh, pretty old guy. And, you know, he was there talking with kids, and he, he's told me I should, you know, come out for the team in the fall. And here's what happens, and here's how we're going to do it and whatnot. Um, and, I, and so I was like, okay. And so I signed up for college classes. And I had to pay for it out of pocket, which it wasn't that expensive. Community college is relatively cheap compared to university, actually really cheap compared to university. At least it was in Arizona if you're an in-state student. So I went ahead, uh, signed up for the classes. I was working at that time Einstein Bagels, the first job my brother got me, which I was making like $7.50 an hour, taking orders and then cleaning dishes in the back uh, all afternoon and whatnot. I'd come home, my my shirt would be drenched uh, like crazy. But, um, you know, I, I remember... There was a moment after that, though. It was kind of like I was going to, okay, maybe this is something I'm going to do. But I remember there was a moment where my friend there, he won the state championship. And then my, the girlfriend I was dating at that particular time, she won the state championship. They were both the fastest in their particular events. One was a 200 meter, the other was a 400 meter. And I remember being up in the stands. And I remember feeling so happy for them and just feeling so... I was so, like one of the craziest bittersweet moments I ever had in my life. I never... I don't think I've ever had that. Em- no, no, I factually, I've never had that emotion. There's certain emotions you can feel in life. You'll never feel that emotion again, or maybe you feel it again, but it's very low probability. This was the only time I ever felt this like bitter, sweet emotion, like go over me where I was so happy for these people that were close to me at the particular time, you know, having the success, the things we talked about, they did it, they achieved it. And then I felt so low about myself. And I just remember just feeling like, like, just incredibly low with me personally and so disappointed. And I think it all went back to football and that being a disappointment and just like, where am I going with my life? And I'm just like, uh, you know, what am I doing? Like, 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 you know, I need to get it together. Like it was hard to explain exactly what I was going through, but I just remember sitting in the stands by myself watching that and just feeling the emotion. I've never felt that emotion ever since. And I never felt that emotion before. It was a weird feeling weird feeling. And so that leads me to college, right? Which the main reason I really even started taking college classes is to run track because I I was like, this is kind of fun. Like I kind of like this. And I was like, this might be actually something I could be successful at, which I needed a win at that time. When you put in so much work towards something and it doesn't work out and you got low confidence, you need a win. And so track was that opportunity. So I went to college, started taking some courses. I didn't even know like what I was going to take. So I just took some generic, you know, whatever courses. I think I took a business course and an accounting course and, a, you know, a couple other random courses because I wasn't really sure where I was going at that particular time, right? I was really just doing it just so I could run track. So I noticed there was a huge change in me. I was suddenly paying attention in class, like something I never did in high school or middle school. I was suddenly cared. And my gosh, my focus level, especially when it came to anything business related or money related, accounting, business management, marketing, anything like that, it was off the charts. Started taking some psychology courses and like all of a sudden, what what am I doing? I'm sitting at the front of class. I'm paying the most attention. I would never even take notes. Everybody else in college, they all take notes. Nowadays, people probably do it on their computer or whatever, right? Everybody would always take notes. Never took notes. I just would just sit there and just listen to the, you know, the professor lecture about whatever it is. And I would just retain everything that they were essentially saying. I never needed to take notes. And my grades were phenomenal. Suddenly, I went from this, you know, do the least to get by to like this amazing student. And all of a sudden, I'm like A's and B's. And all of a sudden, I'm like how am I like an A, B student now? And like, I was so trash and all the other, it's because I was actually paying attention. I was also engaged and it was like a switch. It was a huge switch that happened in me at that particular time. It was also like a level of maturity, right? Maybe it also has something to do with the fact that I was paying personally for those college courses. My parents couldn't do it, right? Lord knows I wasn't going to get a scholarship at that particular time. I ended up getting a part scholarship later on for track that helped me pay. Um, But man, it was what an immense difference. And so I started to really understand, oh, this business thing, like money related stuff, like this is what I'm really into. Like this is, I'm pretty passionate about this. 
And simultaneously, I also wanted to learn about, uh, you know, like how to make your money into money because, you know, I had a bank account. I was starting to make some money from my job. I had a little bit of excess money. And I'm like, I, I knew there was a concept of like growing your money into money, but I'm like, how do I do that? Because I didn't have anybody to teach me. My parents were never really, they were never into that sort of stuff. So I didn't have anybody to teach me of like, how do you make money into money? And I was looking at savings accounts, but you, you know, let me take you back. This is like 08, 09. So savings account got almost no, like I was signed up for Chase Bank and they offered like 0.001% of savings account. I did the math on that. I'm like, dude, I would need to live on this earth for like a million years to, <laughs> to be able to have anything. And so that's when I started kind of looking at real estate and I was like, this is too crazy. I'm, no one's going to give me a loan. Like real estate's not practical. So then I came across a stock market and I was enamored with it. And I had already had thoughts about the stock market as a little kid but never like in depth, right? And I started kind of learning a little bit about the stock market and I was like, what is this thing? And you know, let me try to figure this out a little bit. And I was a little bit lost until I found Warren Buffett on YouTube. YouTube came out and started getting popular around 2006, 2007. And so by the time I was in college, I was using YouTube a lot back then for just random stuff. I'd watch track videos, I'd watch Usain Bolt training or Usain Bolt like, you know, racing or Tyson Gay or whoever were, were the people that were like the track stars at the time. I'd watch football highlight tapes on YouTube. And then I was able to find all these Warren Buffett videos. And oh my gosh, the way he explained the market, he took the stock market for me from this thing of like, this is this big game of gambling and you know trading stocks and trying to get in and out to understanding you're investing, you're buying an actual business. You're buying, when you go buy a share of Google stock, right? You're buying actual ownership, part ownership of Google Corporation, right? If you go buy a share of Home Depot, you are now part owner of Home Depot. And the way he would describe these things and kind of explain his process was, was immense for me. And so I ended up, you know, setting up a Fidelity account. And um, yeah, I was able to set that up because I was working now at Walgreens. I got a job at Walgreens. I got, I think I got bumped to like $8.25 an hour to work in the photo department at Walgreens, which was a big come up, 75 cents an hour extra, baby, let's go. And uh, they had a stock ownership plan where you, if you, when you work for Walgreens back in those days, they would give you, I think it was 15% off the actual share price of Walgreens as long as you held for at least three to six months, right? So that's how I ended up setting up a Fidelity account way back in the day. And so I set that up and then I started buying some actual like, like companies, right? Now, meanwhile, track, I was not that great at first, uh, but I was slowest on the team actually when I first joined. I would outwork everybody. I'd do these workouts after practice, even, you know, do extra workouts. I'd go to the gym, do extra workouts. And uh, I ended up getting really fast. And I, I got my win I needed because I was able to achieve in track what I was not able to achieve in football. When I look back at my football, I was ashamed of myself. I felt like I never did anything. When I look back at my track experience, it was like I started like here and I got here, right? Was I ever the fastest? No. Was I, did I improve dramatically? Was I very proud of myself? Was I able to hang with, you know, kids that were obviously extremely gifted? Yes. And to me, it was everything. And it was a huge confidence builder for me in, in, at my, in my life at that particular time. So suddenly I'm having success in track. Also, I'm starting to have success in school, right? College, like my grades are good now, like, which is crazy to me. Meanwhile, I'm starting this investing journey, which was extremely exciting for me of like, wow, I'm going to start becoming part owner of actual companies, right? And um, just had all that going on simultaneously. And it was, it was uh, definitely a magical feeling at that time where it was like, I was in such a dark place and like the light started to shine a little bit about like, oh, here's, here's where we're going, right? And, you, you know, not successful at football, not successful at school. I felt like I just wasn't successful at anything. And suddenly the, the sun's coming out and I'm successful at these different things. And even though it was just starting points, it was massive for my confidence at, at, at that point in time, right? What gets you through some tough moments like that? I think, I think if you're spiritual, it can definitely help. You know, I've been somebody that's prayed every night since I was a little kid. And uh, having a connection with God can help you out immensely. If you're not religious, I think, you know, you should maybe dive into, you don't have to dive into religion, but just dive into spirituality. There's actually some great uh, college courses I actually took 
in regards to religion, on understanding different religions around the world and what the beliefs are, the thought process, and then spirituality and, you know, having belief in the universe and what, what is going on here. And, you know, my, my belief a lot nowadays about life and why you're put here is I believe you're, you're put here, I think, one, to enjoy yourself, right? Two, I think it's really a lot to learn about yourself. You're going to learn so much about yourself through going through great moments in life and bad moments in life. You can probably even, you can learn just as much from either, but honestly, you might even learn more from the bad times in your life about you when you're, t- when you're in those tough situations, right? And then the third thing is to teach future generations um, so hopefully they can live as good of a life as you lived or even a better life than you lived, right? I think we all would love, you know, if you're pro-human, I think we all want humans to live even a better life than we lived, right? I'm sure our grandparents wanted us to live a better life than they did. And so that, that's kind of my thoughts on, on life in general, right? Kind of summed up into a quick little something there. So then going into the third year of college now at this point in time, right? Which would have been my junior year because I completed my freshman year, completed my sophomore year. At that moment, I was faced with like, what am I going to do now? Because I was, after that next semester in junior year, I was going to basically have all my credits where community college didn't make any sense. So it was kind of like, okay, am I going to go university? Now I was talking, I emailed, cold emailed a couple top business schools in the United States of America. And basically I was trying to finagle my way into getting a scholarship through track. Cause, cause basically the top, a lot of the top business schools in the United States there, they had track programs, a lot of them, but their tra- and the track athletes are not very good. So I basically came up with this thought process of like, if I could get them to give me a scholarship for track because I was actually good enough to be like, like probably the best sprinter on the team or at least one of the best sprinters on the team for them. Then I could get that super expensive business school paid for. Right. So I was like, Oh man, this is, this is, this is good. And so I shared with them my grades and and kind of what was going on there. And uh, I had a couple colleges that were really interested, but the problem was they didn't really give out track scholarships like that for those schools. So I would have had a walk on. So I could have got into those top business schools because of my grades and also the the connection with the track program. So I would have been able to like get it all done, but I would have had to come out of pocket. So that wasn't going to work. So then I was like, well, I'm going to stay in state, go to ASU, something like that, right? Very, very expensive. I would have had to go massively in debt, obviously, to make something like that happen, right? 825 an hour is not getting you a college education. So I'm sorry, that's just not happening with how expensive university is. So I'm looking around, Walgreens, I'm working my butt off. My managers all love me. They love me. Some of them love me a little too much. But uh, anyways, that's a story for another day. Um, but they, they love me. I work my butt off. But the problem was Walgreens was going through a tough time. They were cutting back on costs. They were actually eliminating some management positions. Remember, you know, this is like now we're in like 2009, 2010. And so it was pretty clear, even though I could have been like a top person to get uh, you know, a job as being like an assistant manager, they weren't hiring for anybody. And at that particular time, you know, some of my managers, they had college degrees, they went to ASU, they went to other universities, but it was a very brutal jobs market. So it was clear that I wasn't going to be go become a manager at Walgreens anytime soon. So I applied one night, late night, I applied at Walmart to become a manager at Walmart. I applied Trader Joe's And I applied at a company named Quick Trip. And the Quick Trip company I had heard about, which I didn't really understand. You know, it was like a convenience store and it was a place you used to go sometimes, right? But on the door, it said they started at like nearly $40,000 for assistant manager. But I'm kind of like, it's a gas station convenience store. Like, isn't that a little low? You know, I had better thoughts of me than that, right? But um, Quick Trip was the one that called back. And so I ended up going for my interview. I knocked it out of the ballpark, and very shortly after, I got the job offer. And I took that job offer and never looked back because that job offer that started me at about $40,000 a year. And what I learned at Quick Trip very quickly was it's all internal promotion. They don't hire, like, the high, I got hired at the absolute highest position you can get hired at, which was like overnight assistant manager at Quick Trip. Everybody's got to start at the bottom. And so this was like a, 
the world just opened up to me. Because when you go from, you know, maybe at that time now I had been bumped at Walgreens to like $9.10 an hour or eight seventy five or something like that. And all of a sudden you're talking about making, you know, uh, double, triple that. Ooh, baby. Now we're, now we're talking, right? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to start being able to like invest a lot of this money. So I had my training at Quick Trip. It was three weeks of training. Did great. Started working, right? Got a lot of crazy stories I could tell you guys. Um, quickly, I always let my managers know I'm trying to rise the ranks. I'm trying to move on to the next position. I worked at Quick Trip uh, maybe three, four months, and they put me on a program called ERP, which is essentially I got another bump in pay, and now I was going to different uh, stores and working at different stores and uh, working with different people and things like that, and then an opportunity opened up. Now, this time I moved out of my parents' house, living in an apartment, right? Uh, one bedroom apartment in Glendale, Arizona. It was very, very close to Cabela's, if you know where Cabela's is in Arizona, very close to the Arizona Cardinal Stadium. Uh, beautiful one bedroom apartment, $700 a month. Beautiful apartment, granite countertops. I think it was supposed to be a condo community, but then the great financial crisis hit. It obviously that was a mess in Arizona. Arizona was one of the markets that got hit the hardest. So I think. And then in that, that property, I believe, got sold for like pennies on the dollar to kind of like an apartment type community, right? And then, yeah, rented that apartment for 700 something dollars a month. It was, it was a beautiful one bedroom apartment. So then an opportunity emerged for a very high volume store, very close to me. And I went to that store. And that was the store they moved me to. And that bumped me. Then I started because that store bonused really well. I started making like $50,000. Uh, plus, if you're to annualize it over a year, right? And really was able to start investing heavily now at this point in time because I'm living very low expenses. I was still driving a Nissan. Uh, what was my car? No, it wasn't even a Nissan Versa. What car was I driving at that time? It was a, oh, it was a Hyundai Elantra. The Hyundai Elantra with the squeaky belt. I remember that car. Mm-hmm. I remember that car. How could I forget it? That squeaky flipping flap jacket belt. You turn that thing on, that belt would start screaming on that thing. Woo wee. Uh, I bought that outright cash. I'd saved up, uh, you know, a couple thousand dollars and I bought that off somebody. And um, it did the job. It didn't have, it did, the heat didn't work. That was the only bad thing in the wintertime. But, uh, you know, air conditioning matters more than heat. But uh, anyways, my expenses were super, super low. Owned my car outright. Living for like 700 something dollars a month at that apartment. Oh man, I would eat so cheap. I would eat like ramen, noodles, which back then was like 10 cents, right? I would eat Tontino's pizzas. Um, I would go to Walmart, get a bunch of vegetables, then cut it all up. And then I was doing meal prepping before meal prepping was a thing, man. Just make a ton of different salads with a bunch of different vegetables and stuff. Sometimes I take that to work, put some ranch on it, eat that real quick when I was at work. And uh, just living cheap, really, really cheap. And all that time, just investing. And was able to find some really good investment opportunities at that particular time. Monster Beverage, that, the Monster Beverage investment that made me so much money and gave me so much confidence in the market, that doesn't happen if I didn't work at Quick Trip. Though that came about because I, you know, when you work overnights, essentially, you start around 10 o'clock at night, and then you get off around 7. Well, landscapers do what my dad and I used to do. They wake up very early in Arizona. 4 a.m., 5 a.m. So these guys come in 4 a.m., 5 a.m. What are they buying? Monster, monster, monster. They're grabbing them two at a time. We had a deal, I think, back then it was two for 333 or two for 350. They're buying these monsters left and right. Holy smokers, they can't get enough of these monsters. I mean, it was like a full-time job trying to keep the monster cooler stocked all the time. And they were very loyal to that brand. They didn't drink Red Bull. They didn't drink Rockstar. It was monster. It was always monster. So that's what actually led me to look into Monster. And I would see the sales that we were doing on a daily basis at, or on a weekly basis at my particular store. I'm like, oh my gosh. And then when I was on ERP, I got to see, like, it wasn't just it was that store. It was everywhere. So that, that's what led me to the Monster investment. I looked into the company, read the financial statements. Back then, companies used to send me their annual reports, physical annual report. Some of these were beautiful, by the way. Beautiful. Siemens, oh my gosh. One of the most beautiful... In investor annual reports you'll ever get. The thing was like a book. Oh, it was gorgeous. Uh, but back then they used to set, I used to request like actual physical, like, I don't even think you can do that nowadays, but back then. So it was funny when my current wife, right. Um, you know, when she 
first we first started dating and and you know when she first moved in and whatnot i actually had an entire bookshelf of annual reports because this had like a the apartment i lived in had a nice built-in bookshelf it was just loaded loaded with annual reports of just about any company you could ever want an annual report of i had it right there it's beautiful man the 2009 2010 annual reports for all these different companies so uh but that that's that's how i got into the monster which is an incredible investment cabela's came about because guess what? I lived right across from Cabela's. And I would go walk that store and I was just always very impressed. I also noticed their numbers had kind of troughed and they were starting to head back up. I listened to conference calls. They were talking about opening more stores. I would do the math and kind of, okay, a store does this about this much volume. So that means their revenue is going to go up about this much, right? And uh, the Cabela's investment happened in that apartment as well. And that was at that particular time, that was probably the biggest money maker. It made so much money off uh, Cabela's. It was phenomenal phenomenal return right over the next three or four years also i remember in that apartment finding a company named trinity industries trinity industries i believe is still a public company nowadays cabela's ended up getting sold years back to bass pro shops uh, monster is obviously one of the biggest drink companies in the world now uh, trinity industries was this company and i came across that because i was learning uh, while i was working at a quick trip i was always also focused on like could i get a better job could i make even more money and i started looking into fracking and basically, you could get a job out in North Dakota at that time making 80K, 100K, 150K a year, kind of starting jobs, because there was a big oil boom going on out in the Dakotas, North Dakota specific, right? And I started learning more about the industry, and I'm like, all this stuff has to get transported somehow. They didn't have a pipeline system in place, so you had to do it through rail, right? And I learned there's basically like a monopoly in the United States of America when it comes to kind of like two companies that really produce rail cars. One was a company named Greenbrier Industries, and the other one was even more well positioned, which was this company named Trinity Industries. That also they made a bunch of other stuff like construction equipment. That business was doing bad at that particular time because there wasn't a ton of construction. But I'm like, oh my gosh, like you want to frack all this oil, okay? You're going to need to order a ridiculous amount of rail cars. And Trinity Industries, what a money maker that was for me. So I was able to find some some great in investments while living in that apartment back in the day. I go, it had a beautiful pool. Sometimes I'd go swim in there. It was dead. It was just, I loved it, man. But anyways, so that leads me to kind of that stage. Now, meanwhile, at Quick Trip, I, I'm still, my managers know I want to rise the ranks, right? I want to get to the next thing. I want to get to the next thing. And so I end up getting on the promotion list, finally. Um, well, finally, I say, because for me, it felt like it took forever. But for other people, it was probably a pretty fast climb. And so get to promote it to the next position there, right? But I also let them know because I saw a quick trip was expanding into the Carolinas. And I said, I looked into Charlotte, North Carolina. I said, I want to go out there. And uh, I let my manager know. I let my, um, like the kind of the division overall manager know, hey, I want to go out there. I want to get to, I want to get to Charlotte. I want to help us expand out there. They were really focused on South Carolina first more than North Carolina. So I, I stayed on it, stayed on it. And meanwhile, I'm getting in a serious relationship at this point in time, my girlfriend, which once again is now my wife, you know, she moved in with me. And so, you know, I'm in a serious relationship. I said, you know, I, I think I really want to go to, um, I want to try to help the company expand out in the Carolinas. I think I'll get promoted a lot faster. I think I can move up the ranks. And uh, I looked into Charlotte and I was like, I don't mind living there. And I said, you know, I can understand maybe if you don't want to come, um, you know, what, what do you think about that? And she was on board, right? And so it was uh, like some time was passed and I was getting antsy. I wanted to get the move on. So I stayed on it, stayed on the the. Uh, the PM there in the division, and then I got the call one day. And by the way, this this is actually an interesting time because time was passing, and I was kind of getting impatient. And you got to understand when you're like in your early twenties, you're like twenty, twenty one, twenty two years old. Like you know, you kind of like want things to happen, 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 and everything seems like it takes so long sometimes. And so I was actually like, this probably isn't going to happen. So my my girlfriend and I at the time we were even looking at like homes. Maybe maybe we should buy a home. We were looking in the Avondale area, good year, because I'm like maybe we'll just stay out here in Arizona. And then I got the call. I got the call. Um, I was working a shift, and I don't remember the gentleman's name, but he said, "Hey, this is so and so," and I was like, "Yeah." And he said, it's time. I said, what? 
he said, it's time. You're going to be going out to Charlotte. And, and I, I just remember just being like, because I, I, at that time, I was kind of like giving up on hope on the situation. I was like, maybe they don't want me out there. Because at, at, I, don't, I can't speak to Quick Trip nowadays, but back then, they were very selective about who they sent out. They only want to send the best of the best. Because you got to understand, when you're expanding to a new division like that, you need the best people that are the most like company people that understand everything and are the hardest workers because they're going to set the example for all the new workers who don't really understand the culture of that company. You don't do those things. Right. And so, yeah. And he's like, you know, we're looking at, you know, I think it was two months from now and I'm like, let's do it. And so I went, traveled out to Charlotte. Uh, my mom actually went with me, my mom and my girlfriend, right. Who once again is now my wife. We went out there, signed on an apartment, you know, did a little exploring around Uptown. They don't call it downtown there. They call it Uptown. And then we moved out there. I think it was January of, what year was that? Maybe either 2012 or 2013. So we made the trip. Got pulled over in Amarillo, Texas. We had a bunch of stuff in the back of my wife's Chevy Silverado. And at that time now I was driving a 350Z. My car was loaded with stuff. I think they were, they thought we were transporting some stuff. Let's just put it that way. And, uh, yeah, I got pulled over Amarillo, Texas. Probably the last time I ever went through Amarillo, Texas. That's all I'll say about that. But uh, <laughs> we made it. Made it out to Charlotte. Started building a life there. And learned a lot out in Charlotte. And what I learned out in Charlotte is interesting. Because, you know, you got to keep in mind this is now a melting pot. you got top people from all different divisions of this company all working in this this division, right? You got like the best of the best. Everybody thinks they're the, they're the guy, they're the girl. There's a bottom line with that, including myself, right? Because we're all chosen to be out there. A lot of people want that opportunity. We're all trying to rise the ranks. But I learned, I learned about stress. Never really understood stress until I moved out there because I had big ambitions for myself. And even out there, I was starting to get a little impatient. And I had this one manager, ooh, baby. You want to talk about somebody that was brutal to work for? I had this manager, she was brutal. I never experienced, I was going through so much stress back in those days, I was grinding my teeth at night. I, I didn't even know that was like a thing. I actually ended up Googling it later on. I'm like, oh, that's actually a thing. Like if you're going through massive amounts of stress, you grind your teeth at night, that's how like stressed, I've never been that stressed in my whole life. And the reason was, it was never good enough. My stores were never good enough. My shifts were never good enough. I, she always had things to poke at me for. Um, she was brutal to work for. But she got me up to an insanely high level. I mean, I'm talking like top tier. And then after that, everything was cake just to be quite frank, for the rest of my quick trip career. Now, meanwhile, I'm having a ton of success in the market. I'm getting great returns. It's a good time in the market overall, and then I'm just knocking out the ballpark with stock after stock after stock, right? And next thing you know, I'm over six figures in my portfolio, right? And then next thing, no, I'm like over 150. And I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit 200 here soon. And meanwhile, now my girlfriend, well, now my fiance, actually, we weren't married yet, but we we're engaged. Um, she got pregnant. And so it was kind of like a situation where I was like, I should just focus full time on investing. And I think I kind of got a little burnt out a quick trip too. And so when my first, you know, first son was born, I left the company. And at that time, I was just kind of like focused on investing and I took a full year off, year plus off, right? And that was great, by the way, because, I mean, the first baby I probably ever held in my life was my own baby, which is kind of crazy to think about, right? But, um, you know, firstborn son, I mean, a magical time, a magical time in my life because, whew, I'm leaving Quick Trip, which I was kind of burnt out on. Simultaneously, you know, my son is born, one of the most emotional things ever. Just, what a moment, man. What a moment. I mean, I can tell you the next day that sun shined differently. That's all I can say about that. The next day the sun shined different. So now I'm not working a quick trip anymore. And I've just taken care of my son, right? 
and my wife had her mater maternity leave and then she ended up going back to the, the office and um, and working and whatnot, right? So during that particular time, I made some questionable decisions. And the reason was I was at around $200,000 in the market, but I started looking at a margin. Margin rates were pretty low. And I'm like, dang, man, what if I could invest $400,000 instead of $200,000? My returns over the years were so good. I'm like, why not do this? Well, that led to some problems because when you're on margin, you know, the, the moves down can be much more dramatic and then you can set yourself up to margin calls. And it's very, very dangerous, especially if you don't really have income, right? Which I didn't have at that particular time. So next thing you know, um, you know, some things aren't working out for me. Wind Resorts, I was heavily invested in that company. I knew they had bright days ahead, but they were going through a very tough time. And my cow, the stock just kept dropping. Uh, next thing you know, I was faced with some margin call situations. It got ugly. And next thing you know, I'm doing these like earnings trades and I'm going, I, I never did any of this crap. Earnings trades and messing around with margin. Like the, this was not the stuff that made me successful. This was not the stuff that got me to nearly two, you know, $200,000 in my portfolio before I was 25. This, this stuff, and it almost ended me. I mean, it was a bad situation. Next thing you know, I'm losing money hand over fist. And I'm like, what am I doing? Now, meanwhile, also, I'm starting to get bored. So I, uh, I'm going to start a business. So I'm like looking out there and I'm like, what type of business should I, should I start? And I was talking with a good friend of mine. He was still a good friend to this day. You know, we were kind of running some business ideas by him. You know, I was thinking about starting a perfume cologne company. I was thinking about starting a, a cutting board business, selling cutting boards, like really high-end cutting boards, right? Those are a couple of my business ideas. Thinking about starting uh, kind of like basically like a daycare. I had to just call it that. So I had all these different business ideas. And then I had an idea about a real estate marketing company and using a drone to film like nice properties and things like that. Now, at this time, I certainly didn't have a nice house. We were living in a three-bedroom apartment in um, Henderson, kind of near Seven Hills, if you know that particular area, if you know Vegas well. And my friend, he had, uh, he had a lot of very wealthy friends that had very nice homes. So I said, hey, you mind if, you know, uh, some of them would let me film? And one or two, uh, two people actually did. They let me film their properties. And so I was able to then use that for marketing out to uh, realtors. I would cold email, cold email folks all the time. But since I had a couple of nice properties there and I was able to film it with my drone, which was, this was like new technology back in, this is like 2015, 16. It was like brand new technology, super high quality. People didn't even know drones really existed like that at that particular time, unless they were super up on tech. And, you know, the images and the videos I'd put together were just magnificent for that particular time period we were in, right? And, uh, you know, most of the realtors in Vegas had never seen something like that. The only people I'd really seen something like that would have been high-end realtors in, like, L.A. Or, you know, yeah, pretty much that's about it, honestly. No one really else had seen that. No one out in Vegas was using that. So started getting booked for jobs. And then these people wanted new products that I never even thought of, like community videos. Like, oh, I want to brand myself as, like, the realtor of this community, so I need you to film this and this and this. And then people started wanting to book me for... Um, photo jobs of homes, right? And that, that I learned was like a much more stable business because there's only so many luxury homes that need like drone video and stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot of realtors that need photos for Zillow. So that became like, although it was a lower dollar amount, it was like a very stable business. Now, meanwhile, I had extra time on my hands because when you start a business, it is very rare that you're like, your business is popping like that, like right up initially, right? So I had time on my hands. So what did I do? I had this little GoPro camera, and I knew, well, I, I, you know, more about money than probably 99% of the population. So I'm like, let me just throw some videos on YouTube. Maybe people can find these helpful. And I create these little videos on like what a checking account is, what a savings account is, what a CD account is, like just you know stuff like that, just to kind of educate people on you know these different subjects. Um, I had to negotiate a car deal, which was one of my videos that actually started getting some real good views and traction. And then I started um, a video series back in like 2016, late 2016. It was called uh, Three Stocks I'm Buying. And those videos did really, really well. And it was clear like people really wanted me to talk even more about stocks 
than just general finance. Like it was kind of like that, that's my calling more so than just like general finance. And so sort of making more and more stock market related videos, teaching people what I know, also just talking about stocks, right? And what stocks I was buying at that particular time, stuff like that, right? And my subscriber base grew, uh, my YouTube channel grew. Now we're into 2017 and I'm faced with a tough situation because here I have this real estate marketing business that's going really well. It's funny. I still have like a, a stack of the checks I used to get back in the day. Uh, I mean, we were looking through those the other night in, the, in an old filing cabinet. We have all these just uh, this stack of checks. And uh, like, oh, man, this is nostalgic, like looking at all these checks, right? But um, I had this business and it's doing really well. It's paying the bills. It was my first business I ever started that was a success. But the problem was YouTube views kept picking up and picking up. And so it was a dilemma I had where I'm like, I might be out on a photo job doing, you know, my real estate marketing business and something happened in the market. I'm like, I wish I was home to film a video about this right now. And I'm like, you know, people want to hear about this company just reported earnings and I can't cover it because I'm out doing a a photo job. So this is another one of those moments in life when you got a question, what do you believe? Do you have confidence in yourself? Because I had this real estate marketing company and it was clear I was going to probably have to give it up and chase this YouTube thing more because that looks like a way bigger opportunity, but it was a lot more dangerous. Did I know anybody in real life that was ever successful in in terms of like being able to support themselves through making money related videos on YouTube? No, there was no such thing as that at that particular time. I might literally be the first person that ever actually had a successful business and dropped the business to focus full time on YouTube. I'm not kidding about that in terms of like in the, the money space. No one had done that before. That was crazy. And I did it. And so at the end of 2017, sent all my customers an email and let them know, hey, you know, I'm um, uh, shutting the business down. I'm going to go focus on this other thing. So I did that. And it was the best decision. Uh, I, you know, definitely one of the best decisions I made because I was able to focus full time on YouTube and was, you know, there was obviously a tremendous opportunity for me and it still remains that obviously to this day and through YouTube, you know, obviously made just start making crazy money, like money. I never made that sort of money. Like to me, making over a hundred K a year was great. I still remember one year between quick trip and how much I made off stocks for profit that year, I made like 80, it was like 89,000 or $90,000. And that was like so much money because I made 50 something from Quick Trip and I made another like 30 something from uh, from stock market sales. I think that was 2013. And so for me, that was like so much money. And then, you know, just started making crazy money uh, on YouTube, you know, five figures a month, five figures a month. And it was like, whoa, like, This is wild money. So YouTube, it comes with its ups and downs. (laughs) I told you about the the good part. I mean, you know, when you're really successful on YouTube, you are really successful on YouTube and you make a lot of money, right? But that comes along with a lot of other things. I had to start to let go of control of things. Started not doing my taxes, which even like that was like a big step for me. Like, wow, I'm not going to handle my own tax. I'm going to have somebody else do that. You start to have to deal with hate. I mean, you you, you know, you put out videos and if, if tens of thousands of people are going to watch those videos, it's just going to be a good amount of them that they hate you. They don't like you for whatever reason. Like they, they, that's that's their decision. They, they, they can choose that. Um, they'll make it into whatever they want to make it into there in their own mind, but they're going to hate you. And so you have to deal with that. You have to like, that's a step you have to get over and you have to accept it because you're not going to change that. It doesn't matter how you present yourself. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you do. A certain amount of people will hate you. And so that was like a step of like, oh, that's like part of this process, Right. Kind of like playing football. Sometimes you're going to get hurt. Sometimes you're going to get hit really hard. Sometimes you might get a concussion. You might break a bone. You might, you know, that's part of the process. And in YouTube, you're going to get smacked sometimes. 
And then sometimes you're going to have a public failure. And my first big public failure, you know, I started on YouTube 2016, was a company named GoPro. And I invested in this company and it just didn't work out. Didn't work out. Um, Company was mismanaged. They overspent on stuff they shouldn't have. Their products, they kept screwing them up. The drone product, the battery fell out and they would fall out of the sky. What were they, a Boeing plane? Ah, oh, anyways, um, very embarrassing. And so to have your first loss. But it all goes back to football and understanding how to take a loss. That's why I think everybody should play sports. Everybody should play sports uh, as a kid. You learn how to take a loss. Because I can tell you a lot of people, they would have had a public loss like that and they would have never came back. Me, oh well. Oh well. We'll come back from it, right? Then I started having some successful investments. And the one that really was insanely successful is Tesla, right? And I was somebody that spoke about Tesla extensively way before it was a thing to talk about Tesla on YouTube. I mean, we're talking, this was the days of like, it was me and this guy named Galileo at a, at a channel called HyperChange. And uh, we would make Tesla videos. And obviously Tesla became a huge success, one of the biggest companies in, in the stock market, right? And so that definitely changed the game for me. No doubt about it. That changed the game for me. Yeah. I mean, because that, that, was, that was a situation. A lot of people were watching. A lot of people said Tesla was going to be my next GoPro. Like, like people that didn't like me, are like, ah, Tesla's your next GoPro. It's going to be a failure. They're going to go bankrupt, whatever, right? And um, it wasn't. It was the complete opposite. It was an insane success. I found a company named Elf Beauty. 2,000 plus percent gain later, right? And so, you know, started having good hits, good hits, good hits. So that takes me to today, right? There's so much I've learned, like, like over time. Even in business over the past few years, learned about overexpanding and just hiring for hiring's sake, not a good thing. You would much rather have a few really, really top quality people um, you're working with than have a lot of so-so people. And the more people you add, the more confusion it can have, the more bureaucracy, the slower you can move and, and kind of make decisions and things like that, which is not great. And you don't want that to be um, you know, a situation you run into. So I learned that <sighs> loyalty is always really important to me. Loyalty is always one of the most important things to me in life. I love people that are loyal. And the people that aren't loyal, you know, they just can't be around me. So that's always something I've really, really valued. Like loyalty is huge. I mean, it goes back to a lot of like the mafia principles and whatnot. Like I'm a huge believer in a lot of those principles. Um, you know, I'm a huge believer in a, in a lot of religious principles, right? And things you might learn in the Bible. But I'm also a huge believer in a lot of like, you know, I know it might sound bad, but a lot of like the mafia's principles when you really look into kind of their views on life and loyalty and these different subjects. Um, you know, big, big big believer in a lot of that. So, but overall it's been a journey. And the the thing is, it didn't just happen overnight. I just took you through the process. It all, it goes all the way back to childhood, right? Learning that work ethic, learning how to take loss, learning about feeling embarrassed, feeling embarrassed by yourself, right? That's the thing in life, man. Not a lot of people understand you've got to take losses to, to achieve stuff. And this is one of the great things anybody that's really had success will teach you. You're going to take losses. You're going to have things that won't work out. You'll put in work towards something and it's not going to be there. And you might be ashamed with yourself, but it's part of the process. And also understand there's some things in life you don't have control over and that's okay. You're not going to have control over everything, right? You you just don't. You're never going to. And so you have to be okay with that. You have to accept that as well. Understand there are certain things you can control. A lot of that's your work ethic. That comes back to the work ethic that I learned when I was a little kid. You can control that. You can control how much effort you put in, right? And so for me, to, all this stuff's easy to me. Everything's easy. Like, like, like making YouTube videos, easy. Uh, teaching people stuff, easy. Everything's easy. Because I learned 
about hard stuff when I was really, really young. Listen to a conference call at 1 a.m.? That's easy. Cake. Read an annual report? Cake. This is not hard work. This is fun. This is fun. So when you really learn about hard work, you really learn that things are actually pretty dang easy in this world. And life is what you make it. Positive attitude is also very important. I'll say that. Optimistic. You can't be successful as an investor. You can't be successful as an entrepreneur without being optimistic, without being a positive light. It's very easy to be negative in this world. I think it's a much easier stance to be negative in this world and be kind of like a grouchy person than it is to be an optimist and be positive. But you have a choice. You do have a choice in this life. You can choose to be negative, look at everything from a pessimistic angle. You can choose to be optimistic and look at everything from a positive light. That's your choice. And I know a massive amount of people that choose to be, you know, look at things from a negative angle, usually. The glass half empty, right? That's, that's up to you. It pays a lot better, I'll say that, to be the one that looks at more of the optimistic angle, right? You could have been bearish on the stock market the last hundred years and... Uh, look where you turned out. You could have been bullish on the stock market the last 100 years and you're Warren Buffett, right? So I think that's a little food for thought in regards to that. But uh, coming back to everything to kind of wrap it up, faith, having faith overall, having faith in yourself, having belief, having confidence in yourself, work ethic, being willing to outwork others, I think, you know, the results can speak for themselves, right? The results can speak, speak for themselves. You don't have to be the best in the world at something to be extremely successful, right? You don't have to be necessarily number one. You could be number four and still be great. It's about proving to yourself about you can be great at this thing, right? Overall understanding of investing is just so key. You got to understand, I never am able to start my real estate marketing company without investing. How do you think I bought all the equipment to start that business? The expensive drone and all that stuff. It was all funded through my investment account. And so investing, what what allowed me to leave Quick Trip was the investments. If I didn't make all that money in the market, I couldn't have left Quick Trip. I would have been stuck there for life. And I'm not saying that would have been a bad thing. It's just, let's be honest, my income would have been capped. Um, I would not be where I'm at today if I was stuck at Quick Trip forever, even if I was rising the ranks, right? The, you know, it, I just know, like I know how much people make there and I know how much money I make and it's just not even on the same level. So, you know, it all comes back to that work ethic, come back to investing, having that be a focal point. And also it gets you in a, a good perspective of like income versus expenses because you start to look at things and you start to say, well, what can actually help me make more money versus what's going to cost me money? What can I put more money into, right, to have that generate me more money and more money and more money, right? And I've kind of always looked at things from that perspective. And when you look at things from that perspective, then things that maybe might seem expensive don't become expensive over time, right? So I spent $20,000 on you know, tiling a wall out there that looks really epic with these four by eight slabs. Um, my wife thought it would look great. And I said, you know what? That probably will look great. Let's do it. $20,000. I mean, $20,000, that could be a light day in the market for me, right? So, but it didn't happen overnight. So it's, it's been such a process. But the bigger and bigger your investments become and the more money that starts to generate you, the more you're able to essentially like even large expenses start to become small expenses. And then small expenses become like min- minuscule. But in that first like five, 10 years, you really got to watch it. You got to, if you're spending on anything, it needs to be things that are helping you generate more income. So for instance, me, when it came to college, it was a great investment. Did I spend money? Sure. Yes. Right. Even when I got my half track scholarship, right? For half scholarship there, it still cost me money. But was it worth it? Absolutely, because it helped me generate a lot of money. I learned a lot in college that I ended up, took three levels of accounting that helped me understand balance sheets and cash flows and, you know, income statements and all these sorts of subjects, right? 
that help me then analyze companies. Because if you don't understand income statements, balance sheets, and stuff like that, you can't really analyze a, a company, right? Um, also, learn marketing, learn, learn all these different subjects that help me out immensely. And I think about all the softwares and programs I paid for over the years. They were all worth it because it helped generate me more money. When I think about all the money I spent in my real estate marketing company on all the equipment I bought, oh my gosh, all the tripods and the drones and the, the cameras and the lenses. Was it worth it? Yes, it was worth it because it helped me generate a lot more money. So, you know, if I think about the houses I bought over time, were they worth it? Yes, because those houses appreciate over time. They're worth all, you know, all three properties I own. They're worth so much more than what I paid for back in the day. It's not even like it's a night and day difference, night and day difference. And so that's really where you got to focus a lot of your time and attention are you know, things that can help generate you more money and not necessarily take your money. And then over time, as the amounts get bigger and bigger, whew, I'm telling you, those those small expenses become nothing. And those large expenses, they become all, like nothing over time, right? So I'm just trying to think if there's other, anything else I want to I want to speak about here before I close out this video, because I think it's an important video. I think if you made it this far, I think you really enjoyed this. And once again, let me know in the comment section if you have. I hope you really have gotten some good value out of this here today. Um, the American dream is still alive. The American dream is still alive. I understand there's probably some people watching this that are outside of America. The, the dream in your country is still alive as well. Is the American dream more work than maybe it was 50, 60, 70 years ago? Maybe. I can't speak to that. My granddad lived the American dream. My granddad fought in World War II. My granddad had a house, had a couple cars in New Hampshire, and he lived the American dream. Had two kids. I've been in his little house a couple times, right? Had two bedrooms upstairs and one bedroom downstairs it was probably about 1,500, maybe 2,000 square feet. He lived the American dream. My granddad also fought in the war. He worked for John's Manville, uh, which got in a lot of problems because they had asbestos and stuff back then before that, that whole situation. That's a long story. Um, he also had a siding company on the side. My granddad worked his butt off. He had a full-time job, plus he had a company on the side, a business on the side. Was it easy for my granddad? Was it easy for him to fight in World War II? Was it easy for him to have a full-time job at a factory and then also have a side business? I, I wouldn't call that easy. He lived the American dream, but I, I wouldn't call his life easy. He lived the last 10 years of his life in a wheelchair. Actually, probably the last 15 years of his life he lived in a wheelchair. Was his life easy? I don't think so. So I think a lot of people are being sold that the American dream is dead or it's impossible or you can't uh, work for it. Yes. And I bet you if we went back in time 70 years ago and we asked people about the American dream or 50 years ago, I bet you there would have been plenty of people that said, no, oh, it's impossible. You can't do that. Things are a lot more expensive today. This is a problem. That's a problem. The fact is, if you want to live the true American dream back then, you still need to work your butt off. It still wasn't easy. Did my grand, Was my granddad some baller who was buying fancy watches and going to fancy restaurants? Heck no. Heck no. Man would eat grilled cheese and tomato soup. And he died with, and he never had any bad addictions. And he died with very little money, very little money. After putting in all the work he put in his life. So the fact is, for even a man like that, it was extremely hard. Extremely hard. Back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s. So it's never really been this easy game. It's just an excuse. I think a lot of people use an excuse like, oh man, things are expensive today. Oh, it's hard. It's always been hard. That's why you got to learn work ethic. And if you're not willing to work, outwork people, whew, it's going to be long. It's gonna, it's gonna, you're not, not going to be able to achieve those things. You have to accept that. 
You have to accept the fact that you've got to work really hard in life to get wherever you want to go in life. If you want to live the American dream, if you want to live above the American dream, you want to get rich, you better be ready to work your butt off and sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice. Because it's, it's, it's a lot that goes into it, right? And so there's a lot that comes with that. I, I think about sometimes, I think about like being a, a super mega celebrity. And I think about like, they can't even go in public. Like imagine you're some super famous celebrity. You can't even like walk down the street and be like a normal person for a day. Well, you get to make a ton of money being a super famous celebrity, right? You get all these connections and you can know all these other cool famous people or whatever, if they are cool, well, who knows? But uh, you can't even like live a normal life whatsoever, right? I get recognized in public a decent amount, but I'm like thankful that I'm, I'm not like that known where it's kind of like, oh, uh, you know, I can still go in public and not think I'll get recognized and things like that. That's nice. So everything, you know, another thing about life, it comes with ups and downs. Ups and downs of life. You have to accept that as well. I think that's always important. Everything in life. I was speaking to my kids about the stages of life and we were talking about like being a baby Versus being a little kid, versus being a teenager, versus being an adult, versus being like an old person. And we were speaking about the stages of life and I was telling, explaining to them, all those stages actually come with cool things. They come with good things. They could come with trade backs too, right? And we were talking about every single stage and I was like, well, here's the cool stuff about like when you're a teenager. Here's the cool stuff about being an adult. Here's the cool stuff about being... Like every single stage of life has cool stuff, Right? Every single stage, oh, it has this, it has that, right? You're an old person. Okay, now you have so much wisdom. You've learned so much about life. You get social security. You get, you know, government health care. You get like all these different different things, right? There's cool things. You're probably retired at that point in time. Um, You know, you've been through a lot and you've probably been through all the hardest moments of your life already at that point in time. So it's like, you know, you just have a different view of life. Like every single stage has cool things and also has trade backs, Right? Every single stage. Being an adult, being somebody in your 20s, 30s, 40s, eh, it's cool. It also has trade backs. It's probably going to be the most stressful part of your life, right? You're going to have a job and you're going to have expenses, you're going to have business, whatever, right? You're going to have things to worry about. You might have kids that, you know, the stress that comes with that, right? Kids is like, like the best thing ever, but it also comes with stress. <laughs> so that's the thing, like having children is like the best thing ever. The bet, like, I don't think there's anything, even money, like money is cool. Having kids is better. I'll just be honest with you guys. But it also comes with a lot of stress. You got to discipline them. You got to, you know, make sure they're on the right track. You got to make sure that, you know, that you got to worry about them. So they're the best thing ever, but they're also stress. And that's, that's everything in life, right? Like there's, there's good that comes with it. There's, um, you know, stuff that is stressful that you have to deal with. And that's just part of life. So the American dream is still alive. You can achieve it. You can do it. And whatever the American dream is for you, whether that means be a baller, whether that means just have a house, car, have a good job, whatever, have a business, it's, it's out there for you. But you always got to put in work. Always got to put in work. And keep in mind, having money make you money is so important. It's so important. I mean, you can't just work for work. You got to make sure that money's then making you money, man. Got to. It's one of the biggest keys of the whole money system, the whole financial system. Have your money make you money. And stay disciplined. Stay patient, too. Be impatient, but also be patient. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. What a different one. It's a beast. Um, just unscripted, just kind of thinking about life and, and, you know, sharing my perspective on all this. And once again, if you really enjoyed this video, just let me know, leave me a comment down there. Let me know what you enjoyed with it or if you enjoyed my content over the years and, uh, starting tomorrow, we'll get back to our regularly scheduled program. Much love. Thanks for being subscribed. Thanks for hitting the like button. Thanks for leaving me a comment and have a great day.